I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. <laughs> What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Cool Side Sound Up Podcast. Once again, I'm Josh Shevinoff. As always, welcome by the one and only Angel Ortega. A lot of stuff to talk about this week. Obviously, it is UFC 275 Fight Week, ladies and gentlemen. Let's fucking go. Uh, we're going to hit some MMA news, hit some boxing news. You guys know what it is. As always, if we get into the action, RogueEnergy.com. If you want 10% off your order at RogueEnergy.com, use the code SOUNDOFF at checkout. Let's go with sound off a checkout for 10% off of all your energy needs. It was my birthday yesterday. I went ahead and went and played some disc golf. And you know me, I'm a big outdoors guy. And you know what I decided to bring with me? Some rogue energy. Brought in a little cup. Made sure I stayed hydrated. It was fun. It was great. And uh, I was able to get it with code sound off for 10% off. So go ahead and be sure to use it at checkout at rogueenergy.com. Last Saturday night, UC Apex in Las Vegas, Nevada. Alexander Volkov. Getting it done. Really, I mean, there's not a whole lot to really talk about the coming out of this one, but both guys needed a win to stay in town like attention. It's the massive Russian who gets it. 6-7, towered over Yarsenio, and uh, made it look pretty damn easy. Get TKO 2 minutes, 12 seconds into the first round. Angel, there was some some protesting about the stoppage. I thought it was fine. Uh, but go ahead and give me your take on that, and give me the take on just the win in general for Alexander Volkov. Uh, no, I mean, personally, I was fine with it. I didn't have any issue with it. There was a, uh, there's lots of people complaining. Uh, actually, the first tweet I saw on Twitter was Ariel Hawani complaining about it. Uh, but personally, I, I had no issue with it. I thought it was perfectly fine. Maybe, maybe it's, you could argue it slightly early, cause maybe yours and you could have tried to fight out of it. But, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I don't think it would have made a great difference, but, uh, who knows, right? Maybe it would have, maybe it would have, uh, it was a solid, you know, that fight was looking a little, a uh, little sketchy there in a bit. It, it was going a, uh, a little bit, uh, Yarzinho was kind of doing some stuff that I thought was good. But at the same time, I thought Volkov was doing some things that weren't good. So, yeah. uh, he, he was kind of getting into these, uh, crazy exchanges there for a bit with, uh, Yarzinho. And I was like, ah, oh, this is, this isn't kind of the, the kind of fight you want to do right now. But he ended up getting through a little bit and getting some nice punches through and kind of tagging Yarzinho and ended up getting, uh, getting him kind of out on the feet and getting the finish. Yeah, and full credit to the Arzino. I said Volkov made it look easy just by virtue of it happening so early in the in the fight. I kind of said that, but uh, full credit to the Arzino. I thought he had some. He landed some nice combinations. I thought he had some nice stuff. You know, um, in the end though, it was just it was just too much for him, man. It was it was way too much for him. Um, that sends him to four losses in his last six fights. And um, where do you think he goes from here? Because he's kind of a, he's had a, a standstill in his career. He came in obviously super hyped up, not as super hyped up, but started off 10 and 0. You know, he beat the Ream, he beat Arlovsky. And since then, he just has not been able to get back on the right path. I saw some people suggesting maybe he tries to lose some weight and try to go down to 205. I mean, at this point, what, what do you think for Yarzino Rosa try? For Rolkov, he's pretty much in the same position. But for Yarzino, what do you think? I mean, I don't think you change anything. I think you kind of, uh, do the same thing you're doing now, but just get in the lab, work, pick, uh, pick your fight smartly, you know, in a way, like your opponents, guys, you, you can learn from, but obviously you don't want to take easy fights because you obviously want to progress as a fighter. And, uh, work on, you know, work on getting your output going, work out on, on, on kind of being the initiator of it because he's kind of always been kind of, uh, his, his, his output is just not there. I think that's the big thing with him. He doesn't let it loose. And for a guy who goes from this kickboxing background, it's it's kind of weird to see he's not initiating more and kind of getting the ball rolling. Because I mean, I mean the fight starts in his wheelhouse. You know, for a kickbox, he starts on the feet. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he should he has the advantage from the get go. You know the t- and then obviously work on your on your takedown defense, avoid the ground, and if you do get there, learn how to you know work around it. But uh, I think the big thing for him is just kind of letting it loose and, and kind of getting that. That confidence he had it back. I don't know if it's he kind of gained it back in this fight, and obviously, like you said, maybe there's an argument that he got stopped a little early, and we could have seen more out of him. Yeah. But hey, man, you know it, it doesn't matter now. You know we got to keep going forward and and look at the next thing. You know, find out what's next for you and see uh, what what proper direction we need to take. And I think that's just 
you know, getting good, getting back in there, getting good matchups and, and working on your output. Mm. Yeah, I thought he did kind of, it looks like he lost his mojo a lot and maybe his confidence, but he was really, he had a couple of fights there where he just wasn't throwing. He was definitely way more cautious. He looked like he was way more, you know, he, he was doing a lot better this time around, and, but then he got caught. So he's in a weird spot. Um, I got to be honest, I saw that. I saw, like I said, some people saying maybe he should be down 205. Uh, Brendan Schaub said that. A couple of others. That'd be interesting. Because he's, he, I believe he's six foot and like 250, which doesn't sound like, but shit, dude. I mean, that'd be a lifestyle change. Maybe it'd be worth a look because he's kind of in a position now where like he's not beating those top guys. And uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens for him. For Volkov, though, kind of in the same spot. I think heavyweight's in kind of a position where we're at a complete standstill. And I feel really bad because I, uh, Yarzino was talking about it. He's like, you know what, man? They're doing the interim fight with Stipe and John. Neither one of those guys have really been fighting. Like, we're the ones who are keeping this division afloat, and we're getting no reward for it. Francis is on the shelf. He might be gone. John is Bay. They're supposed to fight for an intertitle, but that hasn't been scheduled. Heavyweight's in a bad position right now, and I feel bad for Volkov because fuck, he's had some nice wins, but it's, it doesn't feel like he's ever going anywhere. Nobody at heavyweight is going anywhere right now because of the division and where it's at, so it's unfortunate. Um, but you know who is going places, Angel? Mosafar Ilouev. This man... Look, dude, he, he needed the big win. Some people were saying he's going to need a finish and so on and so forth. He did not finish Dan Ige, got damn close, but he beat the hell out of him. United decision victory moves to 16-0, and moves to number 10 in the UFC's featherweight rankings. Give me your thoughts on Muzafar Ilouev's victory over Dan Ige and Nicole I mean, beautiful win, man. Beautiful win, look great. It's been a... You know, we, we, I feel like we need to highlight Danny Ige, man. That guy's a, a, a tough son Savage. of a bitch. Savage. Tough motherfucker. Being, being tough doesn't win you fight, sadly, man. And, yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I want to mention him a little bit. Just give him a little praise because, you know, it's, it's been a little rough lately. I hope he can kind of piece it back together, get back in the mix, and uh, continue to be competitive. But I think getting to the title is going to be hard. And I think I mentioned that in his last few fights. Uh, and kind of rally it back because obviously we want to highlight the winner. Good job, man. You did it. Keep going. Now you broke into the the kind of like mix. I think he called out. Didn't he call out Arnold Allen? I believe. Yeah, correct. I'd be down for it. Put the records on the line. Let's get it. Yeah, same. And I I like that fight a lot. And um, dude, I I like. I didn't want to down Danny game man, but you got to give him just because I, I was talking about like how good LOL's victory was. But dude, god damn, he is so tough. Jesus Christ, I have no idea how he's able to continue, especially some of those knees, man. That's essentially more or less where I'm coming from. But um, regardless, you know, he, he was able to go ahead and make it to the cards. Unfortunate, I believe that's his fourth loss and fifth in five fights, I believe, um, which sucks. But at the end of the day, man, full cross to the web for the victory. I want to see that on a wild fight. Um, Fairly, it's another division that's in an interesting in an interesting place. Obviously, uh, Alexander Volkanovski, Max Holloway, they're going to be fighting uh, next month, I believe, July second, the trilogy. And from there, we'll see what happens to the division. Uh, maybe Elov can be that guy who could potentially build himself to being a nice title challenger, but obviously that remains to be seen. Um, but as of right now, it looks pretty damn good. Uh, as far as the rest of the card goes, man, uh, I like this one a whole lot. There's a whole lot of fights to talk about. Which ones were your which ones were your highlights of the night? Ooh, okay. Well, I need a highlight. I mean, we got we got to start with the the feel good moment of the night, but also the sad moment of the night. Uh, Carolina and Felice Herring, Josh. It was a, it was a feel good moment for Carolina because obviously she got to win after such a long time. I don't think I've ever seen a fighter more so happy after a win. Like I don't think I I haven't even seen people win a title and be that happy, Josh. If I'm being right. quite honest with you. She cried. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And she cried. And we've so seen did people, I. Uh, yeah. And we've seen people cry, right? And we've seen people get emotional. There was just something that was a little different that, that resonated with me. I was just like, damn, that is uh, – you can tell there was this kind of like a, like pressure, kind of relief, this this liberation offer. Yeah. And, I was, and obviously for Felice Herring, I believe, if I remember, it was a retirement, right? She she laid down the gloves. Correct. She retired in the cage, and uh, that's the end of her career. And, and that's the end of the career, and in and, and a, and a good one, man. You know, we gotta I'll, I'll throw her some love. She's she's tough. Uh, she she was amazing, and uh, she she I mean she really went ahead and uh, I believe it was back um around like 2016, 2017. 
she was kind of she was kind of like a middling fighter. She turned herself into like a ton of addiction. She had like a really nice like four or five fight win streak. Um, yeah, man, she's not somebody who will really be remembered like probably five ten years from now. But she had a nice run. She always she was always game, always in shape, so on and so forth. So props to her on a great, on a great career. For sure, for sure, man. I I, I just you know I had to show them some love, man, because that was a uh, it, it, like I said it was it was it was a difficult one because because of, of everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. For sure. Um, but, yeah, I mean, dude, Caroline getting a win, it, it tugs on the heartstrings, man. I mean, because Caroline has always been, like, a super, super sweet person, always been a nice fan favorite. She's been through some shit, man. I mean, I remember she was thinking about retiring after she, like, nearly got blinded by that Yan Jo Nam fight. And then she turns around and got submitted again, four, five fight losing streak. I'm glad they gave her another shot because, dude, that might be the greatest I've ever seen Caroline of age. Straight up, that might be the greatest I've ever seen her. Um, she looked really good. So, um, yeah, man. I mean, as far as far as she goes, super excited to see what happens next for her. But I feel like we got to go ahead and there's a lot of storylines, you know, in this in this kind of card. But dude, Alonzo Menafield taking on our boy Askar Mazrov. We were very excited for this fight because at one point in time we we were watching his highlights, Askar's, and we we're like, man, this guy's got 25 and seven record. He looks good, you know. Comes to bang, and then, man, just all the shit happening on fight week. His record was changed, like, three or four times. And then he goes on to just get absolutely annihilated by Lonzo Metafield. He had, he had his moments. He landed a couple shots, but that was about it. Man, give me your thoughts on that whole situation. Alonzo, obviously, he picked up the win, and he looked damn good doing it. But for Astro Mazarov, that might be a wrap on his UFC career. Just me? And I don't know, man. I, I think this should give him another chance just to see. Cause he had a, he had a moment in there. You know, he had a little moment in there. And, uh, you know, say what you want about it. But I mean, I, I think there's still something to work with there. Hmm. Yeah. I don't necessarily disagree. Um, I think that there's some still some stuff they could do. But he generally doesn't tolerate this sort of shit whenever, like, who who is the what's the guy's name? Dean Barry, the Irish guy. He got caught after one fight when they added a lot of shit. So uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Um, yeah, I mean, as as far as far as Mazarov Mazarov goes, I thought he had you know some nice moments, but you know we'll see what happens with him moving forward. Um, our boy Zaruk Adashev, that's probably be a wrap on his UFC career. Uh, he faced Ode Osborne on the main card, got annihilated a minute in, and he was landing some good stuff early. He's coming out, coming out firing, um, but yeah, man, that, that was that was that. Um, we also got to go ahead and it's a, it was a, it was honestly Angel. I got to say, dude, we have our boys. Like everybody has their boys. Our boys had a rough night on this fucking card, dude. They had a, <laughs> they had some rough some rough times. Those things. Rukadashev lost. Uh, Askar Mazarov lost. Alex da Silva not only you know not only lost, he's covering the UFC, Angel. As as the Alex De Silva fan, like Stan on this podcast, give me your give me your thoughts on him and his UFC. Uh, we talked about it in the green room, Josh. I I didn't think it was a good decision. I was devastated by it. I was heartbroken. I I really think they should have stuck around with him. Like I told you, I think he was kind of a project guy, a guy you had to keep long term around and and uh, work with, and you know make him progress uh, and, and build him up because I think he still had a lot to work on his game and. Uh, I, I think they're going to regret this one, man. I think he's a good kid, and I think they'll be like, damn, we should have kept him around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree. I thought it was also not a bad decision. I thought it was a close fight. I thought this level one, though. And to go ahead and cut this kid, there's a lot of – this kid's 26. He went three. I mean, they didn't really cut him necessarily. He, he went one and three in the UFC, and generally speaking, four or five deal probably. But, dude – a loss to Alexander Yakolev, a win over Kazula Vargas, a loss to Brad Riddell, and a banger of a fight. And then a decision loss to Joe Selecki that I thought he won. I mean, that being a UC run, that's that's really shitty, honestly, the fact that he got cut. But like I said, this kid's only 26. I think PFL makes a lot of sense for him. We were talking about it in the green room, as you mentioned. But, um, yeah, I think that would be a nice move for him. We'll see what happens, though. I mean, this kid still has way too much potential to not be picked up in the near future. Even though he lost this one, and Joseph Lucky's a bad motherfucker too, so, um, yeah, I mean, we'll go ahead and see what happens with him moving forward. Um, but yeah, overall, a, a rough night for our boys, but still some other nice fights on there. Uh, Tony Gravely picked up a nice knockout over Johnny Munoz. Benoit St. Donis picked up a nice one over Nicholas Stoltz, second round submission. Damon Jackson continues his low-key 
His low-key winning streak, super low-key. I mean, he's won three in a row, four of his last five, with a one loss being to Ilya Tapura. Bad dude. Um, Jeff Molina getting the split decision win. Some people had an issue with this one. I didn't have an issue with him winning. The 30-27 that went for him was a little bit strange, but is what it is. Um, and then opening up the card, Aaron Blanchfield defeated J.J. Aldridge via submission. You know, I thought she lost uh, round one. And I saw some people saying she got exposed, and I thought it was kind of bizarre because I'm like, you know, they were the fight just started. She was two minutes into round two, but anyways. Um, no, Josh, yeah, she got exposed. You she got exposed. From- you know, uh, I guess that's 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 how it is. But you know, anyways, um, yeah, man, I thought she, I thought that was a good win for her. She's still only 23 years old, and she's talk. I mean, now she's ranked. Actually, I don't know if she went up after this one. Let me check real quickly. She was already, she was talking about fighting Shevchenko. Not soon, but she wants to be the one to dethrone her. And I don't know if that'll be the case, but women's flyweight. She's no longer ranked for some reason. She, I guess she was removed from the rankings prior to this fight, and Tracy Cortez is in there. So I didn't even know that happened. She was on Wiki, they listed her at 15. So anyways, yeah, she's not even ranked. So anyways, uh, kind of bizarre that she's not ranked, but uh, anyways... Um, yeah, man, still a solid win for her. J.J. Aldridge, uh, another veteran who lost at the hands of Aaron Blanchfield. 23 years young, future champion. Don't at me. But uh, anyway, as far as UC Vegas 56 goes, is there anything else you're looking to talk about on this one? No, man, I think we co- we covered it pretty well. Uh, we we kind of hit the main ones. I, I also, there's one more I do want to – I need I need to highlight my, my boy that I was waiting for his debut. We're not frocking it off. He came out. He had a UFC legend in this corner, former uh, – UFC, I think UFC 7 tournament winner, I believe is what we had in his corner. He was there, I think Oleg something. I could be wrong, or I could be thinking of, thinking completely different wrong name. But he was there, he had him there, and he was even, I don't know if he was there just as a support or, or actually there as coach, but he was in his corner. He got a nice win. Uh, that guy's a menace, man. Just, just wait. All, one seven years, you, you're gonna have a tough time with this guy. Mm-hmm. For sure, for sure. Um, and yeah, man. Overall, this this card was a a nice one for for some young prospects. Uh, obviously, rip rip our boy Alex Silva, but still overall pretty nice, man. Overall pretty nice. Um, moving on though, Angel, it's the big one. It is UFC 275 Fight Week, going down from the Singapore Indoor Stadium at Kalang, Singapore. We got a couple of big fights now. This one's not as deep. The, the UFC generally has kind of been putting together. Let's just call it for what it is. Pretty bad fight nights, and then they'll stack pay-per-views. This one's not exactly the stacked pay-per-view that we kind of envisioned, but the top three fights, and there's still some other ones I'm a big fan of, but the top three fights specifically are about as good as it gets. We'll start off with the main event. Glover Teixeira, the UFC's light heavyweight champion, 42 years young, uh, taking on the young phenom, the Jek the Czech Samurai. I mean, what what else have you got? Yuri Pozhaka, the baddest motherfucker. Uh, I mean, he might be the baddest motherfucker on the planet. Angel. We've got to go and we've got to go and say it. He's a samurai. He has a really cool hairstyle, and he's out here fucking dudes up at 205 pounds. However, if there's one question that we've always had about him because we haven't seen him in the UFC, is his takedown defense, his jujitsu. It's going to get tested. On Saturday night against Glover Teixeira. Angel, he's a, as of right now, according to the betting odds, obviously it fluctuates from site to site, but generally speaking, he's a two to one underdog right now. The champ. Do you think he can upset the odds one more time and pull off the win over Yuri Proshock? Look, look, look. We, we got, you know, like you, like you mentioned that there, there's some things we haven't seen or certain things that need to be tested. I, I'm curious to see how, you know, like I mentioned, I, I mentioned this in the Rose and, uh, as far as the fight, I was like, look, I'm going to favor the stand up person at this moment. You know, and I, it's not, I'm not saying because of, like, not because as far as I didn't have good enough stand up to somewhat get, you know, to do what she has to do. But, uh, in this fight specifically, man, I feel like there's a significant advantages in both places, just like in that last fight. Glover has a significant advantage at this moment in time on the ground from what we've seen so far in Yuri's UFC career. Granted, you know, there's I'm, I know when he fought in Ryzen, he obviously fought some Mercer Slayer and stuff like that. There's a different period of time. It's nowhere we, you know, 
I feel like we can't look at that time period and compare it to now because a lot of stuff has changed and he's here now and he's fighting a different level. You know, he's fighting a much higher level. Not to say some of those guys couldn't compete now, but uh, he, he's a fucking killer, dude. He's a fucking killer. He's a fucking savage. And uh, I, I, I think he's going to do it on the feet, man. I think he's really strong on the feet. I think he's going to be able to beat him out. And uh, and uh, I, I, like I like I said in the Rose White, I think once the takedowns comes in, I think it could, it's going to be a hell of a different fight. How's he going to react? How, how's he going to deal with it? He's going to make him tired, can geek back to his feet, you know? Like, what all is going to change? Right now, I'm going to pick Yuri. I think I, I said it from when we made it in once I started team. I think this guy's the next big thing, man. I think he's the next big thing in this division, and I think he's going to be a champ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. And this is uh, this is one of those fights, and I, I'm very conflicted. I'm very, very conflicted. When you and I picked Glover, and we picked Glover for a lot of his run. I didn't pick it for all of it. I'm pretty, you've been with that old motherfucker pretty much the entire time, but, um, right. I, I hopped on near the end there. Uh, and look, man, just watching his run, you cannot, you can't not root for Glover Dickshare. You just can't. It's impossible. He's one of the nicest guys in the game. He always puts on fun fights. And the fact that he's 42 years old and the UFC's light heavyweight champion is, it's insane. I mean, that's just called for what it is. That being said, he is facing a young phenom and a guy that is maybe maybe he's not the best motherfucker on the planet, at least not yet. But this dude has some of the most innovative striking. Dude has 25 wins via knockout and 28 wins. And most of those wins are, like, ruthless knockouts. They're not, like, a little TKO. In the words of Jeremy Stevens, when he hits people, they don't fucking move. Okay? And he's had two sensational knockouts in the UFC. One of them was a fight of the night against Dominic Reyes. The other one was a knockout of Vulcan Usamir. Neither one of those guys are known for, like, being easy to finish, and he did it relatively easily. Maybe not Dominic Reyes. Dominic Reyes literally put him out cold at one point. But anyways, that's besides the point. <laughs> um... Yeah, man. Even with all that being said, Angel, you may have hopped off the Glover Tech share train. I'm putting all my money. Oh on that man, push. I'm putting all that money in that Glover stock, my man. Uh, Bet the house on the Brazilian. Bet the house on the Brazilian. I'm betting the house on the Brazilian. You can't stop that old train from chugging along. Um, I may. Re- I feel like I'm gonna regret this on Saturday night when I'm watching with you and the boys. But I'll tell you what, we didn't last time. You know, I, I think look. I'm cutting you off a little bit here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Last time I was full on confident. This time, I, I don't know, man. You're, you're a fucking killer, dude. And at the same time, though, Glover, he's been hurt, man. And he's been coming back and, and been getting defended. You know, he's been able to get the win. I, I just don't know if he's going to be able to do it this time against this guy, dude. This guy's, uh, this guy's a fucking savage. He was, we didn't even mention it, but he's, he went out to the Cejudo gym. Or he was working with Cejudo. I wouldn't say Cejudo's gym, but he was training yeah. with Cejudo. And you know, he's been working with those group of guys in the team out there. And shit, we know John's out there, too. I mean, as far as getting wrestling rips in, I mean, I don't know if he was working with Jones, but if he was available, shit, who else would you want to be working with, working with in the division who's already beat the guy and is also a good wrestler? Exactly. Exactly. Um, he's doing everything right, but at the same time, I just – there. I feel like the question mark has always been the wrestling, and I think if he – it depends on honestly how he, how he kind of takes this. If he goes in there wild – I see a lot of people being like, oh, yeah, he actually needs to be wild so he can catch Glover. I think the exact opposite. I think if he stays out there and uses his length and tries to outpoint Glover and just tries to catch him slipping, I think it's probably his best strategy. But he goes out there fl- spamming flying knees and doing some crazy shit, I think Glover probably gets him down and puts on a master class in jiu-jitsu. I really think he does. Um, I think Glover's going to have to weather the storm, but I think he's going to get it done. I think this is a matchup that it's it's one of those ones where it's going to be Go and eat, like, after it ends, we're like, oh, yeah, no shit, that was always going to happen. And we talked about that a lot on the show, but that's that's how half of, like, top, like, that's half of, like, top-level MMA. Like, just contrasting styles and shit. It's super obvious how it's going to go one way or the other. But, yeah, man, I've, I've been I've been on a roll with my picks lately, man. I've been I've been hitting some, hitting them out of the fucking park. I'm going to go ahead and shoot this one out of the stadium as well. I'm going to go and take Glover Teixeira. Put all your money on that old man. Um, I won't, but, <laughs> but if you, if you guys are betting, if you're betting inclined, you know, I, it's, it's not a bad look, especially considering he's a two to one underdog. But anyways, co-main event, another title fight, Valentina, the bullet Chechenko looks to defend her 125 pound title once again. She has 
I mean, really not been tested her entire run as champion. Obviously, Joanna, when she, she fought for the title, Joanna took a round. That was a fun fight. People forget that one. Uh, outside of that, Jennifer Maya took one round back at UFC 255. She's lost a combined two rounds during her time fighting for the women's flyweight title. And she's been champion for nearly four fucking years. Just think about that. Four years of champion, two rounds of loss. That's some Fedor Milianenko shit right there, my friends. But Let's go champ! Anyways, she's taking on Talia Santos. Now, Talia Santos, 28 years young. She's 19-1. and one. Her one loss, the split decision loss to Mario Romeo Bola, uh, Bola, Bolera back in February 2019. Since then, she's won four in a row. And none of those fights have really been competitive either. She beat the dog shit of Molly McCann, Roxanne Montefiore, and she submitted Joanne Wood back in November 2021. That was more of a a uh, a nice just submission finish after she battered her on the feet. Um, as of right now, Angel, I went, somebody went and posted the betting odds. I wish I could remember who it was, but Talia Santos is, uh, like, of all Shachenko's fights at flyweight, she's, like, the third closest betting underdog. And even then, she's still a plus 600. So... Uh, Angel, give me your take on this one. I know that Tali Santos is not really, she's kind of like a trendy, upset pick. Do you think she'll be able to get it done? Look, uh, it's possible, right? I'm not going to take it away from her. There's always a possibility in any fight that anybody could win. Obviously, we're never going to take that away from anybody. I, I just, at this moment, it's, it was the same thing with Amanda, man, and, and, and what I was thinking in the Juliana fight. I mean, I'll, I'll say this. In the Juliana fight, I had very little thought that she could win. I didn't expect that when it happened. I don't have this that feeling necessarily going into this fight. I'm still going to pick Valentina, man. I think she's too good. She's too well-rounded. She's too many levels ahead of everybody. Tala Santos is good. I do think at this moment in time, though, she's the only one outside of Amanda Nunes who can maybe do something. Mm-hmm. Um, that's saying a lot, man, because, you know, and it's not to disrespect the other girls, but it's just at this moment in time, Valentina is just so many levels ahead of everybody else, man. You know, yeah. and, and it can't even be questioned. You know, I, I had some hope for Lauren Murphy to do some decent stuff. I didn't think Lauren Murphy would win. But I at least wanted her to make a good account of herself. Uh, she got murked. Yeah, sadly. But uh, <laughs> Talia Santos, I think she can maybe present a different look, you know. And you never know. Maybe she makes it close, you know. And then we just – we're like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Everybody hold their, you know, hold themselves back a little bit. Hold the popcorn. Mm-hmm. We have a challenger, you know. Mm-hmm. Even if she doesn't win, there's still a possibility. I just want to, and if anything, I, I I want to see the best out of her. I think she has a possibility of, of doing something here. I'm not going to be picking her, but I'll say this: don't doubt her. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this division, dude, I really think she's probably the only one who who I'd give a decent sort of chance to. I mean, Kayla Chikagan already beat her pretty flawlessly. I think Kayla Chikagan's done a lot of really. I give her props when she fought a couple weeks ago, but like I thought she's done a lot of good things, like a really like. Becoming more aggressive, she's changed up her game. Even then, I think if they fight again, Shachenko wins relatively easily. Lauren Murphy already got marked. Jessica Andrade back at 115. Talia Santos fighting this weekend. Alexa Grasso. I love Alexa Grasso. Huge Alexa Grasso fan. Loses very easily. Man and Faro, I think would be very interesting, but maybe not now. Maybe in a couple of years. Same thing for like Aaron Blanchfield, Tracy Cortez, some of those younger prospects in that division. Uh, Talia Santos, as of right now, probably the biggest threat at, threat at 125, but it doesn't matter. I think Santos has the capacity to maybe catch her because she has, for that division, she has some freak power. I mean, she lands some huge shots, especially on Joanne Wood and Roxanne Montefiore. Dropped them both multiple times. Um, but I don't think – I think Chichenko is way too fast. And the difference between her and Amanda Nunes, Amanda Nunes has always been kind of content to, like, she'll search for a finish, and if she doesn't get that finish, the secret's always been out. Like, oh, yeah, she gasses a little bit. She becomes a little bit more reckless if she's whenever she is gassed, you know. Shevchenko is not like that. She's willing to have the worst fight of all time if it means she comes back with that belt at the end of the night. That's always been, like, she's had multiple stinkers as champion, and that's not me, like, trying to be, like, me, and that's just reality because she's so safe. Talia Santos is probably going to go out there. I think she's going to land some shots. I think she's going to have some success. But I think Shevchenko is going to, I think she'll have the upper hand on the feet because she's so fucking quick. And I also think that I expect this fight to happen a lot on the ground, too. I mean, if you look at Atalia Santos' background, she has decent jiu-jitsu, especially from the top, but it's always... Her one loss came from Mario Romeo Bellella holding her down. 
So we'll see what happens. I mean, I think that's probably the key to victory for Shevchenko, but we'll see what happens. Um, moving on down, a women's strawweight title eliminator. I don't necessarily agree with this one being a title eliminator, but it is. The winner of this fight will fight for the title next. We're going to have the rematch. Wei Li Zhang, former champion. I thought she probably arguably should have been champion again after that second fight with Rose Namajunas back in November. She's coming in technically having lost her last two. Prior to that, her last win was Joanna Jacek, March 2020, in the greatest women's fight of all time, top five fight ever, including men or women, UC 248, March 2020. Split decision win for her on that night. It's going to be Yun Jacek's first fight since that fight. And uh, look, dude, very rarely is, does the rematch live up to the hype of the original. But as far as even, even with that being known, I don't think there's a chance this is a bad fight. Give me your take on this one. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's three rounds. Obviously kind of disappointing for us, but I think uh, we we talked about it way back when it got announced. I don't know if we mentioned on the show. Uh, I think it might have been who you who said it. I mean, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but that the three rounds kind of benefits Whaley, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, especially if she kind of comes out with that, uh, you know, come forward, aggressive, you know, elbows, you know, good clinch work kind of style. But granted, though, Yuan is also very strong in those aspects, too. I mean, she came from that. Was it Muay, Muay Thai originally, right? It was Thai fighting, uh, I believe. I believe, and was, yeah. Yeah, she's very strong in that wheelhouse too. So, I mean, it, it, it's it's not a it's not like there's a it's not like she has a significant advantage, but you know what I mean. It, you know, she benefits from it because Whaley's so so good at it. And she has a lot of power. She's very physically strong. Uh, she's just a great athlete all around. Uh, and uh, I mean, as far as how this fight's gonna go, man, I, I'm just I'm hoping it's in some capacity, just as good. I think the big question is, yohanna has been out for a while, right? She hasn't fought since this fight. whaley has been active. Obviously, she got knocked out in one of her fights recently, and then she had a, a, a pretty good performance against Rose in a, in a fight that I thought also that she won, and she's, she looked better, and she gave us a different look. Obviously, when she got put on her back, that you know that, that was kind of a glaring hole she she showed, and uh, that you know it's, it's something that she's going to have to work on. But... Uh, you know, I, I think she's the one been improving. She's been in the mix. She's been working. She's good. I like. I thought she fought. She won the the first fight, and uh, and she's been active. So I think she'll come out here. And, you know, have another great performance against Shawana, and especially in a three round fight that I think benefits her. I think she'll catch her a win here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this fight is very much a coin flip for me personally. I mean, I think this one of the main events super coin flip for me personally. Um, but uh, you know, I do think the three rounds actually does benefit. Whaley, and I think she deserved that win over Rose last year. With that being said, Angel, I cannot pick against Joanna Champion. I just can't. Oh, man. She, she would not be coming back if she was not – because, you know what, dude? She's been out of action for two and a half years. She waited for the right fight. She waited for the right matchup. She's been training this whole time. I think she – I think she either sees something in Whaley or something, right? Because she's confident as shit, dude. Like – even whenever somebody asked her about, like, the fact that Dana said, like, the winner of this gets a title shot, she's like, yeah, I wouldn't be back here if I knew I wasn't going get to fi- get a title shot after this. I know that I'm going to fight for the title next. Like, I forgot how much I liked Yolanda, dude. Like, she, she's a very fun personality, always comes to bang, and uh, always comes to have super fun fights. And we'll see what happens on Saturday night with this one. I have high expectations for it and probably won't live up to the hype of the first one. Uh, which is fine because they have three rounds instead of five, and that's a huge issue. But yep. I, I'm not going to pick against Joanna Champion. I think she's back for a reason. And uh, yeah, man, very very excited for this one. I'm going to take Joanna here. And if dude, wouldn't that be some shit? If you know, <laughs> it'd be so funny. We essentially be in the same position as we were like seven years ago. Carlos Barr is the champion. Joanna Janjic fighting for the title. History potentially repeating itself, but. We'll see what happens. Uh, you know, this card, after that, it definitely falls off, which is fine. I do like this flyweight fight a lot, though. Uh, flyweight contender fight between Rodrigo Bonterran and Manel Cape. Manel Cape back after popping for, um, I can't remember, what, was it Was it EPO? It, it was something. I can't remember I what it was. I have no idea. I, I, I was going to look into it, but I never did. Yeah, I, I he popped for his last fight. I can't remember what it was. Um, but anyways, he only got like a, what, like a two, three month suspension because it was like a, uh, a small dosage, which never made any real sense to me. Um, 
Anyways, but he's going to be back, and he's trying to earn his, I believe, third win in a row. Yep, correct, third win in a row. He's had a couple of knockouts, came in with a lot of hype, had a couple of rough first few performances. He's definitely a bit hesitant, but he's back. He's on the right track, only 28 years old. Give me your thoughts on this matchup. I think it's a really, really good one. It's a really good one. Uh, he's fighting Rogerio Brontrin, which arguably he, some people would say he, he should have beat Brandon Royville on his last time out. Uh, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I thought Royville won it, but I, I got the argument for it. A lot of, I think most of the, I think if you go on him and made decisions, most people had Bontrin winning. But regardless, he's here. Good matchup. I'm excited for it. And look, Manel Kep's kind of finding his stride. He's feeling comfortable. He's letting it loose. He's, 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 he's being out there. He's being active. He's, he's throwing it out there and he's getting the finishes. If we get that same guy in this next fight, I think he's able to win it, man. I think he's, he's just that good of a talent. Uh, sadly though, in his first two outings or in his two first two fights in the UFC, he just wasn't putting it out there. He wasn't giving us enough and he was letting it go to the judges. And at the time he could have already won one of those two, but and he kind of got set back, pushed back a little bit, kind of built himself up a little bit more, which is perfectly fine. He finds himself here in a good position where he could, uh, you know, potentially keep making his way up the rankings. Mm. Yeah, correct. I did was a little argument for Rodrigo Batarian defeating uh, Brandon Roy Valens last time out. Um, I didn't necessarily agree. I mean, I, I mean, I thought that he lost. I thought Roy Val won, but I, I, I got, I got it. You know what I mean? Um, technically speaking, he is winless in his last four fights. He had, he had a winner return due to testing positive. Uh, for a banned substance, don't remember what it was, but anyways, he's technically, technically, oh three and one is in his last four. That being said, I still think he has a lot of talent. He's still ranked in the division, but I do think Manel Cape's going to continue his rise. I think he he had that rough patch, but I think he's on the right track, and uh, dude, I still think he's a lot of potential. We gotta forget, we gotta remember, dude, this kid's twenty eight years old. But he's still very very young. And uh, for him to have the success that he's had, already being a risen champion, already been top contender over there, now already making his way into being a top contender over to the UFC, kid's super fucking good. I think he gets a win on Saturday. Opening up the main card in another, it's a, you know, let's just be honest, it's a low-key banger. It, neither one of these guys are ranked, but still a lot of, uh, this is going to be very fun fight, in my opinion. Jack Della De Madalena, I believe I pronounced that correctly, maybe I didn't. In my defense, I'm a very stupid person. I barely speak English. But anyways, uh, Jack Dylan Madalena, coming off a knockout win over Pete Rodriguez, UFC 270, he beat the dog shit out of that kid. And he's taking on Hamza Imaev, um, former N1 global champion, obviously. We know the kind of story on him. He's had a mixed UFC run. He's coming off a loss to Danny Roberts back in October 2021. Part of that, he had picked up two wins in a row. Winner here, probably... Maybe not breaks into the rankings, but they get a step closer to that. Give me your thoughts on this one. You know, last time, like you said, we saw Jack come out and have a stellar performance against Pete Rodriguez. Granted, though, Pete Rodriguez probably shouldn't have been there. Uh, you know, no, no hate to Pete Rodriguez, but I think at this, at that moment in time, this was just not his level. And, uh, Jack is really fucking good on the feet, and we saw that. Uh, because his opponent, I am going to pick him against a Russian. I'm, you know, I think he can do it. Actually, fuck it. We'll get a Jack finish, Josh. You know what? Oh. Let's fucking go, Angel. I'm also taking a Jack finish. God damn, he looked so good in his last fight, man. I'm on the hype train. I really am. Maybe poor Pete Rodriguez is just a bad match. Maybe he's had a bad night in the office, but I'm all on the Jack Della hype train. I am. Just going to say it. So, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take him getting a finish here. Um... But regardless, that's a very fun fight, and I'm glad it's opening up the card. So, Angel, as far as the rest of the card goes, a uh, bit of a mixed bag here. There's some good fights, some not really great fights that I really don't really care about. But go ahead and give me your take on which ones you're looking to forward to the most. I mean, the fight that I thought probably was going to open up the card when originally, you know, they were setting up the card. I thought it was going to be Brandon Allen, Jacob Balcoon, which is a banger. Mm. Uh, I think that's going to be a fun one, big, big one for Brandon Allen. Kind of wants to get a few wins rolling here. It was the last time I got one against Sal Malvi on, I believe, short notice. He came in to replace someone, and he just came in. He was fighting at 205. Uh, obviously, before that, tough one with Chris, Cur tough one with Chris Curtis. Now he disagreed with Jacob Macoon, which Jacob Macoon, not a crazy bit record, but when he comes out here, man, he fights his fight. You know, he, he, he stays to his plan. He fights his strengths. He does it. 
I don't know if it's going to be necessarily a really good one for him this time around, but, you know, uh, not trying to give, you know, not trying to make a pick or anything, but you know, I'm curious to see what he can do against Brandon Allen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same. I'm very excited for that fight. Uh, Brendan Allen, obviously, you were correct. He did have a really, really short notice win over Sam Alley. That fight was honestly a bit of a banger. Um, because they both came out and swung to bang. Still, I mean, he's a young dude, still has a lot of potential. And Jacob Malkoon, a guy that honestly, I really didn't kind of expect to have the success of UC that he had when he got signed. I mean, he got signed at like 4 0. Young dude, he got murked by Phil Hawes in his Houston debut, and since then, he's kind of put, put it together. He's having some nice wins, so I'm glad to see him back, and that's going to be a fun fight. Uh, Sung Woo Choi taking on Joshua Cabello. Uh, probably pronounced that name wrong. Apologies. Uh, that should be another fun fight on the prelims. Steve Garcia is back. He's another guy that he's coming off of that absolutely banger that nobody watched. I mean, nobody. I loved that fight against Charlie Antetavaros. Mm-hmm. Um, back in October 2021, excuse me, a bantamweight fighting a lightweight. Uh, actually, a guy who used to fight at welterweight, fighting guy used to fight a bantamweight, which is a banger of fight. Uh, super underrated. Go watch it on Fight Pass or whatever if you have time. Uh, regardless, it should be a fun one. Really, the kind of highlight of the prelims of like anything outside of the main card is Andre Fiala taking on Jake Matthews. That's an absolute banger. Jake banger. Matthews, considering how long he's been in the UFC, um, he's been in the UFC for eight fucking years, and he is 27. So this kid is it's it's mind blowing how long he's been in the promotion, how young he is. Like, I always think he's like 34 or something. But anyways, um, he's coming off a loss of Sean Brady. Prior to that, he had a nice three fight win streak, and we know the story on Andre Fialo. This dude is fighting every single week, seemingly. Uh, fourth fight in 2022 alone, and it's holy only shit. June. Yeah, four fights, and it's only June. Just oh think God. about that. The UFC gets hard off that, dude. Holy fuck. Dude, guaranteed. They're bricked up right now. Uh, I can't blame them. Anyway, so I'm very, very excited for this one. Well, Super that's the end excited. of his contract right there. Huh? It's going to be the end of his contract. True. And he, he he better get fucking paid, dude. I know that uh, I think it was UFC 270. They released the purses. Guess how much he made for that fight against. That's a banger against. He made like 12 12? Yeah, 12. Yeah, 12 and 12. Well, only 12 because he didn't win. Exactly. Mind-blowing. Hey, man. But he's made money since then, though. He's gotten his pay, and I think a bonus is in there, too. Mm-hmm. So not not bad. Mm. Yeah. Um, but regardless, hopefully he gets a huge contract. Huge one. After this one. And I expect him to win, honestly. But I can see Jack, Jake Matthews pulling it out. He's he, He's a live dog in there, man. That kid's always scrappy, but... Anyways, as far as the rest of the card goes, I really don't have anything else I kind of want to talk about, personally. Outside of just, I just do kind of want to mention, dude, women's featherweight never die. Just, people talk about it not being a real division. I'm kind of inclined to agree. But Ramona Pascal taking on Jocelyn Edwards, and they're opening up the card at women's featherweight, so uh, I think it's, uh, we'll I think it's because happens. it's short notice. I think that's why. Really? Yeah, 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 because I think they both fight at, or I think, and Jocelyn fights at what, 35 normally. She does, yeah. Yeah, so that's the other thing. And Ramona, I'm not sure. I believe, let me look at it real quick. Also, which well, actually, no, she had a featherweight bout last time, and she's fought at, she's fought at as high as 150 at a catch weight, so. Okay. Yeah, but she's fought at 135, so. I think that's her regular weight, and since she came in on short notice, her last fight against Josie Nunes, that was at 145. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, yeah, man, women's featherweight's uh, refusing to die, though, so, you know, <laughs> maybe the winner of this will find Amanda Nunes. No, I mean, we did We did see, um, they just booked a, a fight. I can't think of who it is in women's featherweight. It's, uh, Dan- oh, yeah, um, Danielle Wolf is going to be fighting Norma Dumont. Her official UFC debut. Yeah, that's a rough debut, dude. Jesus Christ. Um, but- I thought the same thing. Yeah, that's that's fucking tough. Just dude. you wait, Josh. Just you wait so Daniel Wolf submits Norma Dumont. Yeah, we'll we'll see about that. Uh we'll see, dude. She's gonna fucking Imanari roll right into her. Take yeah, that. You wait until she sees you next time. Um, <laughs> just you wait, Josh. I think you're mistaken. <laughs> Anyways, um this should be a really fun card. It's it's kind of it's not super top heavy like how we're kind of a, a but, but it's to. fun. 
but it's, it's fun. fun. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Look, I, hey man, remember what I said about last week, Josh? I changed your perspective on it. There ended up being like multiple finishes that night. Yeah, correct. So, I think there was like four finishes on the main card. Yeah. Yeah, and every yeah. So, uh, and then this week, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think it'll be like a heavy finish card just because of the kind of fighters that are on it. No hate, but uh, I feel like just because it's a pay per view, kind people always show up to the pay per view. You know what I mean? So I yeah. think that'll make it also good. True. True, and this one should be a lot of fun, though, regardless. It doesn't have the huge names, but there's a lot of good matchups on this one. Um, as far as UC goes and MMA goes, that's it for this week. However, we still do have a boxing recap. Uh, we got to go ahead and talk about it, dude. George Cambosos beating Devin Haney in Marble Stadium in Australia. The winner was going to be the first ever undisputed lightweight champion since Pernell Whitaker in 1990. Shout out. Devin Haney, at the young age of 23, has already etched himself into the history books. He defeats and, in my opinion, dominates George Cambosos on his home soil, nonetheless. It was so easy, they had to give it to him. Ends up winning 116-112, 116-112, 118-110, 118-110 and new, unified, lightweight champion. He holds all the belts at 135. And give me your take on Devin Haney, giving the performance of a lifetime. Hey, man, that's what you want to see. That's how you want to win it. That's how you want to capture titles, especially at this point in his life, man, so young. But this is where the pressure starts, man. He's got to defend his those belts, and it's going to be a, maybe a, a lifetime of defending belts for him right now, man, because he's, he's a champ at such a young age. You know what I mean? He has a target in his back at 23 years old. I mean, that's some – uh that's a that's a big status to hold right now at this age, man, and especially to maintain it. That's going to be hard. And uh, for me, it's just kind of what's next. You know what I mean? Obviously, mm-hmm. you know the the the, the Cambosis fight happened, and I, I had picked Cambosis at the time, but I knew Kenny was more than capable of winning. I I actually wanted to change my pick at one point, but I was like, you know something, fuck it, I'm gonna ride with it. You know, I'm gonna stick with it. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know turn my back on Cambosis because he's already had his back turned on so many times. You know. You know, in his previous fight. So I was like, look, I'll, I'll stay with this guy. I'm going to pick him because I think he can do it. Then ended up being him this night, man. But uh, at least he'll be in the mix now, man, you know, because cause he's a you know, former champ and uh, had a good performance against uh, the, the prior champ, too. So I'm excited to see where he goes, too. Uh, I, and, you know, as far as Haney, it was just a good technical fight out of him. Yeah, you know, it was something I heard someone say, you know, Haney, Haney was the better boxer, and uh, but Cambosis is a really good fighter, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, there's a big there's a big difference between those two things, and sometimes uh, some people don't understand what that difference is. Yeah, correct. And look, man, that was just a rough matchup for him, dude. George Kambos is, is is a great um, he's he's a great brawler, and he puts on fun fights. But dude, Devin Haynes just had the right style. They're talking about doing a rematch. I really don't have much interest in it, but I will give Kambos a lot of props if he does decide to take the rematch rather than stepping aside you know, and getting paid for it. Um, I'll give him a lot of props for that, even though a lot of people may not want to see it. Sometimes, you know, those automatic rematch clauses, there's still some fun shit that happens, dude. I mean, nobody wanted to see Deontay Wilder, Tyson Fury t- 3. After the second one was a blowout, but guess what? It ended up being one of the greatest fights of all time. But as far as last Saturday went, dude, performance of the lifetime. I gave Kimbosos two rounds, but I think you can make a, a, a case for a fucking sweep, dude. Um, By the way, that's what I heard someone else say, too, 10 rounds. <laughs> Just, you yeah. know. Yeah, I gave him. To, I, I rewatched it. Well, I didn't rewatch it, but I went ahead and like watched some highlights just to make sure I was like, you know, because I scored it live. But anyways, yeah, man, it was just, it was a great performance. Some people were like, oh, he was boring. I'm like, I get why some people think that, but just watching him style on him and like, yeah, dude, you're fighting an undefeated monster on his home soil, and he's making it look easy. I mean, that was fucking impressive. That was super, super impressive. So, especially uh, that arena, dude. That that state. It was a stadium, right? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was huge. It was beautiful. It was packed. Yeah, it's what, you remember it's where uh, Izzy fought uh, Whitaker. So that's what I, that's what I thought. I was wondering if it was the same one. That was a it was a beautiful scene, man. Like when, when they were, I watched. Uh, we I watched the whole card, Josh. Really? Uh, so you I, saw I, Lucas Brown get a nice knockout? I did. I did not expect that. I was like, dude. Yeah. I actually joked about him when he came out, but I'm like, he kind of just looked like a killer. I ended up fucking. Uh, oh, you know it? who Luke's, you don't know who Lucas Brown is? I'm aware of Lucas Brown. Okay. But I made fun of him because I was like, oh, you know, I was like, 
because I knew about a what was it Junior Junior Fall right? Yeah, Junior I was Paul. aware. I was aware of him too. And I was like, I don't know how this is gonna go. And then then that shit happened. I was like, well, there goes there goes that. Yeah, I believe Junior Fall was like a fourteen to one favorite. You know, um, yeah. I mean, he he his last fight was against Joseph Parker, and he didn't win, but like he had some moments. You know, um, yeah, man, that was a huge upset. Lucas Browns looked like. I mean, he is 43, but he's looked bad for a while, you know. Um, he got knocked out by David, Dave Allen, dude. So, like, he's, he's, he's not exactly great. But, anyways, yeah, honestly, shout out him. That was honestly a really nice moment. I was, he's always seemed like a really nice dude. So, love to see it. Love to see it. But, yeah, man, as far as the main event goes, it's just super, super impressive. I cannot, I cannot be more impressed. But we'll see what happens with, with him in the future. Devin Haney, potential rematching. Who knows? Maybe we'll fight Lomachenko. That's, that's what I'd like to see, but. Uh, regardless, we'll see what happens. Angel, we got some MMA news, and this isn't all MMA news, but we got some news to hit this week. Just got a couple of things. Uh, we'll go ahead and start off with the Ultimate Fighter, because last week we talked about the Ultimate Fighter, and really, not really, I mean, we're pretty much the only people who talked about the Ultimate Fighter, but uh, anyways, we're enjoying this season, but next season could be even greater, because... <laughs> Tony Ferguson last month said, you know what? I, even though Habib retired, I still want to compete against him, which, gee shit. Honestly, love it. But he said he still wants to compete against him. He suggested coaching tough. Habib came out and he's like, you know what? Sure. I'll go ahead. L- let's do it. Let's do it. And now Daniel White was asked about, asked about it yesterday and he's like, you know what? Yeah, I'm down. I'll look into it. Let's do it. You know, Angel, give me your take on a, on a Habib Tony Ferguson Ultimate Fighter season, which could potentially be on the books. I mean, that could be a fun thing. It could, it could put the Ultimate Fighter get some decent attention behind it because you know Tony has a good big following, Habib has a big following. I think as far for the you the, the the tough brand, that'd be a great thing. Hmm. Yeah, same page, same page. I know that some people actually it was interesting because Dana was like shocked. He's like, "You guys seriously want to see this, even though they're not going to fight at the end?" I'm like, "Dude, what, Dana?" There's been multiple seasons where, like, <laughs> people coach and they don't fight. Conor Rigger, your eye favorite, was one of the biggest seasons ever, and they didn't fight. Although they knew, fun fact for you, if uh, Nate didn't accept UFC 196 to fight Conor on, like, two weeks' notice, guess who would have been, Angel? It would have been Faber. It would have been Faber. Faber agreed to it. Parents, they already told him that apparently that he had the fight, and then they were like, well, we're going to give Nate one more go, and Nate ended up agreeing. So there's your fun fact for the day. Oh, my God. Imagine how that fight would have gone at the time. Oh, yeah, Connor would beat the dog shit out of him. But that's just, the fact that he's willing to take it is, like, so, so dope, honestly. Um, yeah, I remember hearing about that. Yeah, but, um, yeah, man, I I, lo- I want to see this. I think it makes all the sense in the world, considering that nobody really watches the Ultimate Fighter, fighter outside of us, Angel. I mean, I, I don't know what Wouldn't you love a, a season of Tony? I would. I would love a season of Tony. And, just and, that, and Habib's a great coach. So, I mean, they could do something like USA versus Russia, you know, get all Russian fighters on Habib team and get all American fighters on uh, Tony's team or, or Mexican-American fighters, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and honestly, it, it'd be it'd be a lot of fun, but we'll go ahead and see what happens just because I don't have high hopes for this thing. I, I, Dana, the fact that... This, if, he didn't really give, like, he, he said, like, oh, yeah, I'll do it, but it seemed like he was joking. For some reason, Dane doesn't really, there's, like, these big, these big moments, and he doesn't really seem to give a shit, you know? Like, these, for a promoter, it seems like he kind of misses the ball a lot. Maybe that's just me, but I think it has a lot of potential. Um, but I'm sure we won't see it happen because of, like, money or some reason, but anyways. Yeah, they probably have to pay those guys a, a nice amount, and, you know, the way the Ultimate Fighter is going, I'm sure, like, the profit isn't that great at the moment. Yeah, probably not. Um, but anyways, uh, moving on. Greg Hardy. He's back in the news, Angel. Obviously, the last time we saw Greg Hardy was inside the Octagon, losing his third straight fight. Got knocked out by Sergei Svivak, Taito Ivasa, and Marching Dibora. You know, after that, he became a free agent, and there was really no talk about him actually doing anything, which is kind of surprising considering he does have a lot of name value and considering, you know, he did have an honestly a nice run considering his age, considering the lifetime of football. Uh, however, we now know his next career move. It'll be not inside the ring. Well, excuse me. It'll not be inside the octagon. It'll be inside the ring, the boxing ring, Angel. 
The Prince of War will be making his debut in the Squared Circle October 8th um, in Florida. His opponent is not yet known. However, he is being promoted by Black Sheep Promotions, which, holy shit, what a perfect promotion. <laughs> what a perfect promotion for Greg Hardy, of all people. Uh, I really don't have a whole lot of thoughts on this one, but Andrew, give me your take on this and his potential uh, you know, boxing career. I mean, fun for him. At least he still wants to compete, right? You gotta respect that. Uh, do we know? We don't. You said you don't. We don't know who his opponent is, right? Did I hear you? No, right? not as of now. As of, I mean, hopefully, I mean, if he gets the right matchup, maybe. maybe you know, there could be something interesting there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it'd, it'd be interesting. I don't really know what he's trying to do as far as like. Is he trying to become a world championship box? Like, I'd like to ask Greg Hardy this question because like, I feel like sometimes. You don't think we could get Greg Hardy on the podcast, Josh? Probably not. No. You you don't think so? I think we could. No, I don't. I don't think so. I, I think we could. I yeah. You know, I I think I could get Greg Hardy on the podcast. <laughs> you know what? You reach out and see what happens. You I will. You don't think Josh? I will. Honestly, agree. I love that. I love that. Uh, I think we'll cut this out if he does not come on the podcast. <laughs> we don't know. The, we they don't need to know about our failures, but uh, <laughs> only yeah. about our victories, right? Yeah. Correct. Correct. Only about the dubs, but. As far as uh, as far as Greg Hardy goes, I mean, he has a lot of you know ability as like an athlete, but at this stage in the game, learning a new sport, another one is just going to be tough, man. I mean, he's got name value, so maybe we'll see him on one of these Jake Paul undercards, you know? But maybe dope. Maybe you find another football player. That makes sense. That make maybe Big Baby, you know? Ah. Big Baby's making his debut on Jake's undercard for some reason. I, yeah. I'm pretty sure actually has IRS issues. That's probably why, but. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens with Greg Hardy. As far as him, I'm, I'm he doesn't really have too many options. So I get it though. I do get it. Um, I'm sure he probably tried to get an MMA promotion, but you know, who knows? Considering his name value and how much he's being paid in the UFC, it's a little bit different. You're going to have to move to like like a re- more regional promotion. So I'm assuming that's why he's in the boxing. But obviously, I don't know. Uh, but moving on, dude. PFL has announced their schedule. For the following month, and dude, there's a fucking stacked PFL card. PFL six on July first. Now this card has a lot of really great matchups. Larissa Pachenko is back on there. Um, obviously the main the main card itself is just a banger. Ray Cooper is backing up Brett Cooper. Roy McDonald is back, but the main event is very compelling. Probably the, be- the best fight of Kayla Harrison's career to this point. Uh, obviously, she has a she pretty much very well aware at this point. She stayed in PFL due to like the the contract stuff. Like they have the rights to match a contract, and they tried their best to go out and get some other big names. The big name they got for the PFL this season is Julia Budd. You know, former Bellator featherweight champion, former strike fe- strike force competitor. We kind of know the story on her. She's very very competent, very um very well rounded. And they're going to be squaring off at PFL 6. Give me your thoughts on this matchup. Obviously, we really don't talk about PFL too much on the show as far as because, like, the way our show works, the way our upload schedule works, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to actually, you know, talk about them considering they fight on, like, Wednesdays and Tuesdays and shit. But give me your thoughts on this matchup. I mean, I think it's good. I mean, she's going to be fighting one of the best people she's ever fought. Sadly, though, I mean, Josh, it doesn't mean a lot to me. And it's not to disrespect Julia Budd, but she's never she's fought the three through some of the three greats ever, you know, in the female division. Amanda Nunes, Ronda Rousey, Chris Cyborg, but she's lost to all of them. Correct. It's, you know, kind of kind of sad. I mean, if she she would have beat one of them and she had one like one of those names under her, but I feel like I'd be a little bit more interested. I mean, I'm still interested because she's a uh, she's big time, you know. She she's she's one of the better you know female fighters out there. And she's going to be, you know, fighting uh, Kayla Harrison. I mean, maybe she can do something. We'll, we'll see. But you know, we've seen her come up against these these all time greats, and it hasn't worked out. But you never know what could happen at this stage in his career, in her career. Maybe she can do something against uh, against Kayla Harrison, and you know, be like, all right, maybe Kayla Harrison wasn't as good as you guys thought. Hmm. Yeah, I, I. You know, Julia Budd is an interesting one because. She does. She has faced like some of the goats, Nunez, Rousey, Cyborg. Like you mentioned, she lost all three of them. She has a lot of other great victories though uh, under her belt: Arlene Blenko, Marlos Kunin, 
Caitlin Young. She has some solid wins. Um, I do think she's starting to climb. She's 38, and she lost to Gina Fabian last time out, who already lost to Kayla Harrison. Uh, but in terms of name value, this is by far the biggest fight of Kayla Harrison's career. I do expect her to walk through her, though. I think Kayla Harrison might be the greatest women's fighter on the planet. Not because of any of her wins. Uh, well, granted, she is beating a lot of, like, lower class. I mean, I think Liz Pachinko is pretty good, you know. Um, this, there's some good names she has, but I just think the fact that she beats them so easily is what makes it really high on her. You know, I've, I've always said, like, if you're fighting bad fighters, how you beat them is just as important as you beating them. And she, I don't think she's had, like, a one close fight. I don't think she's lost a round, let alone a minute of her career so far. So, so um, it's some rousey ass performances, you know, at, at the yeah. top rousey of, you know, pinnacle. Yeah, although she, the difference between her and Rousey, though, is Rousey would, like, submit people, maybe she'd knock them out. Kayla Harrison just beats the dog shit out of these women, dude. Like, some of these are hard to watch, you know? Um, like that Invicta fight she had, I can't remember who, like, Courtney King. Dude, it was like a, it was like a crime scene, you know? Yeah. Um, she was able to elbow her, you know? She can't do that in the PFL. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, as far as, as far as, uh, as far as this fight goes, I am excited for I think this PFL card is very nice, so super excited for that one. Uh, last bit of news of the day, Angel, it's boxing news. We've talked about Devin Haney and George Camboso, so now it's only right to talk about Anderson Gibb taking on Austin McBroom. You know, nearly a year after that first Social Gloves event, uh, which was a complete clusterfuck, um... He, he's going to go ahead and Austin Broom's going to try and give it another go. And it's going to be, this one's way more interesting to me because it's going to be a professional boxing match. You know, no headgear, four ounce gloves. They're going to actually do the damn thing. Give me your take on this. Are you excited for this one? I know that Le'Veon Bell is apparently going to be on the prelims. Oh my goodness. Somebody. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Is it he still playing football? No. Oh, I thought no, he was. He's not. He played last season, but nobody's picked him up. So it's, it, and he looked pretty damn washed. That's probably it for his career. That's what you think, Josh. But he's gonna make. He's gonna win in boxing. He's gonna make a return. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> no, I mean, as far as the event itself, I mean, I'm curious to see what other kind of names they can get on there. Who, who they decide to pick up. Uh, it's a fun matchup. I think. It, I think. Uh, uh, funny enough, I was going to mention when we brought up the fact that uh, Jake was in a fight for some reason around the same time Gibb announced that he was going to have a fight and he was going to announce the fight. I was like, dude, what if it maybe is Gibb? At least this kind of shuts that <laughs> out. Cause, you know, I was like, I don't know, maybe he maybe gives Gibb another shot. Fuck it, right not? You know, you know he can beat him. And at the same time, and Gibber's got him better, which, I mean, Josh, I know you didn't follow Anderson Gibb. Like, you don't know his whole YouTube career. Yeah. I followed him way before you did boxing. Wow, what a fucking roller coaster this man's life has been. So, well, he's he's lived a fun life, or he's living a fun life, I should say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gibb is probably the guy that I don't really know much about him outside of you see like YouTube boxing and a couple of videos I've seen here and there. He's definitely the guy that probably has my respect the most in regards to, uh, you know, in regards to like their career, especially like their boxing thing, because he's just like he's like a small dude. Who has a bit of a weird frame? You can tell he's not very athletic. Like guys like KSI, like the Paul brothers, even Austin McBroom, they're either physically enhanced in yeah. some of those cases. I guarantee, guarantee you. Not going to name names, but you know the ones, uh, or at the very least, they're like athletically gifted. Gibb doesn't have either of that. <laughs> he's a smaller guy. You can tell he's not really on any of the juice, or if he is, it's clearly not working for him. Uh, and uh, But he goes out there, he works fucking hard, he's in the gym, he does everything the right way. So full cro- full props to him, uh, I think he's going to be a tough matchup for him. Austin Broom's like very athletically gifted, he's a former basketball player, I believe. Um, but, you know, we'll see if he gets paid after this fight, that should be interesting. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, man, I, I mean... I'm excited for this. I, I'm actually legitimately excited for this. It's going to be going down in the Crypto.com Arena, which, stupid fucking name. I hate they change it. But anyways, in L.A., it's going to be pay-per-view. I mean, they're putting some nice names on the undercard. So, I yeah, we've always been in on YouTube boxing more than a lot of people. Like, now they're starting to, like, pay more attention to it. But we've been on this shit since day one. Day one, uh, baby. And, huh? Day one, baby. Day one. 
So yeah, I'm excited for this one. I'm very, very excited, and we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, I'm 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 very, very excited for this one, but it remains it remains to be seen what is that who exactly is going to be in the undercard and on and so on and so forth. But it's not too long from now either. It's like, July 30th. You know, it's yeah. a month. It's in a month. Yeah, correct. July 30th. So very, very excited for it, dude. I mean, I have seven figure giver. He's back. Um, I like that. Yeah, we'll see what happens though. Very, very excited for it. Should be fun. Should be fun. A lot of these YouTube boxing events are always fun. I actually thought social gloves, even though the everything that happened afterwards was just like horrific. I actually thought like the production value and like the the overall just event was way better than a lot of these other ones that have happened. Or maybe it's just me, but I thought that one was legitimately fun, and I didn't know any of those fucking people either. So, uh, well, I know like probably like three of them, four of them, but um, yeah, man, this should be a lot of fun. Uh, but I believe that's all the topics we got. Is there anything else we talk about before we close out? No, man, that's it. All right, sounds good. I hope you guys enjoyed. As always, I'm at Josh Shivenoff on Twitter. He's at Angel Take underscore O one. Oak at Courtside Sound for all things related to the show. Hope you guys enjoyed. Peace and butt grease. Mouse click.